Welcome to the webinar. Um, very welcome, Dr. Shelley Siroff, the president of Canadian Heart Failure Society today with us. Uh, she's also the director of Heart Failure and Heart Transplant Clinic at St. Bonifix Hospital in Winnipeg, and the head of the Medical Heart Failure Program for the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority um, of the Cardiac Sciences Program. She is involved in many things, um, including HFLA clinical trials, um, the work that she has tirelessly done with um, the national and the provincial patient group and primary care to operationalize the hub and spoke models for heart failure care that many of you may have heard, um, as well as she's a member of the Heart and Stroke Foundation Mission Critical Area Council on Heart Failure. We are thrilled to have her here today with us, and she will be sharing her experience in the clinical practice for heart failure. Also with me, right next to me, uh, very fortunate to have her in person, Dr. Karen Hartness. She is a cardiovascular nurse for over 30 years with 15 years of experience working at Heart Function Clinic at Hamilton Health Sciences. She is a member of the Canadian Cardiovascular Society Heart Failure Guidelines, member of the Board of Directors and Executive Committee of the Canadian Heart Failure Society, a clinical strategist and subject matter expertise for heart failure at Core Health Ontario, and also an assistant clinical uh, professor with the Faculty of Health Sciences at McMaster University. As you can see, she is very active in uh, working in this space, and we're lucky to have her uh, out of her busy schedule to share her passion about how we can improve health system design and also promoting patient care, uh, center care. And specifically today, she will talk a, a little bit about a few tips for self-care for those who are living with heart failure. And last but not least um, is Dr. Jillian Cote. Uh, she is the president and co-founder of the Heart Life Foundation, the Canadian first and only patient-led heart failure organization. As a heart failure survivor and two-time heart transplant recipient, Jillian is an active ad ad advocate for the inclusion of patient as partner in healthcare policies and research. Um, Jillian is a co-chair of the Oversight and Advisory Committee for Patient Voices Network, a patient partner on the Shared Care Committee, as well as a public member on the Medical Service Commission for the Province of British Columbia, a member also of the Heart and Stroke Foundation Mission Critical Area Council on Heart Failure. And on top of all that, she is an assistant professor in the Faculty of Education at the University of British Columbia, and she came with a lot of great um, talent on um, artistic design, including the Heart Failure Awareness, Awareness Day logo. So today she will be sharing with her, uh, with us, her experience living with heart failure and how she can live a full and busy life um, with heart failure. So with no further ado, we're gonna jump right into this presentation. Just some quick facts about heart failure many of you may have already heard. Um, it is still a uh, very important uh, uh, disease that has affected many of us. Over 600,000 of people in Canada is living with heart failure. It is continued to be on the horizon and it has many impacts on a patient experience, especially many of them happen to have to go back and forth in the hospital a lot and with very long stay. And in our recent 2019 heart and stroke report, we have also identified in our recent research that the increase in hospitalization due to heart failure has increased over 25% in the last decade. And this is not only limited to people of older age, this also is observed in people at younger age between 30 to 39. And more importantly, um, you'll be surprised that one in four people in Canada still don't know what heart failure is, and this is the reason why we are here today to talk to you about it. So in this presentation, as I mentioned, you will learn a little bit about heart failure. You'll learn about the clinical practice uh, from our cardiologists here, um, and as well as some self-care tips and um, also some patient experience from Julian. And over to Karen. Or over to Shelly. For the uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, present today, and it is our our first ever National Heart Failure Awareness Week. And what we really want to do is draw attention to what heart failure is, uh, and and give people uh, a better understanding of what it's like to live with heart failure. So thank you to the Heart and Stroke Foundation for this opportunity. 
Um, so heart failure is really a condition when your heart can't pump enough blood to supply your body's needs. And what I often say is that you either your heart is too stiff or it's a weak pump. And I actually, let's see if I can do my hands here. I often say a normal heart pumps like this and your heart pumps like this if it's weak versus those individuals who have stiff hearts um, have a, a different uh, process undergoing their uh, cause of heart failure. Can we go to the next slide, please? So how do we know someone has heart failure? We look if you have any risk factors for heart failure. That can be high blood pressure, that can be diabetes, that can be a family history as well. Um, so it's really about talking with your doctor and them learning about your, uh, your past history. Do you have any symptoms or signs of heart failure? We're gonna go over those today as well. We look at some test results, including EKGs that check your heart rhythm, X-rays that look at your lung fields, and we can see if there's any water on your lungs. And we can also do an echo or ultrasound of your heart. And there are several other heart tests that your doctor may order in order to make a diagnosis of heart failure. There are also some blood tests as well. But there's no specific test that says you have heart failure all by itself. We really need to put the pieces together and you're involved in that process of, of understanding why somebody has a diagnosis of heart failure. Next slide. So there are many reasons why somebody can get heart failure, and these are known as risk factors. And the most common are a heart attack. Over 50% of individuals with an underlying diagnosis of heart failure have either had a heart attack or a silent heart attack or have blockages in their coronary arteries. And this is more common in men. On the other hand, high blood pressure is a major risk factor for heart failure as well. And this tends to be more common in women. Again, diabetes is something that can cause uh, heart failure as well. And even having leaky or, or tight valves can be a, a cause of heart failure. You may hear about people who have caught a virus and developed heart failure. That's called myocarditis. Some people are born with heart problems. That's referred to as congenital heart disease. In some circumstances, there may be a hereditary history. Excessive use of alcohol or different drugs may cause heart failure. And irregular rhythms of the heart, such as atrial fibrillation, can lead to heart failure as well. Next slide. So there are many different symptoms related to heart failure. The most common being shortness of breath, either exerting yourself, walking around your house, going up a flight of stairs, um, and then a lack of energy overall and fatigue can really be the most troublesome. Some people have swelling of their feet and ankles as well. They can get swelling of their belly, so their belt buckle doesn't do up correctly or their pants don't do up correctly. And that's all, both of those are signs of fluid retention. If you're having difficulty sleeping at night, either lying down flat, you feel short of breath, or you wake up at night gasping for air, increased urination at night can be a sign. Difficulty concentrating because of lack of blood flow to the brain and overall fatigue, and cough or frothy sputum is another one. Next slide. Now, there's something that the doctors often talk about or your care teams talk about known as an ejection fraction. And an ejection fraction is what I call the heart pumping score of the heart. And this score is not out of 100%. In fact, a normal score is about 60%. And when the ejection fraction score is less than 40%, we talk about you having a weak heart or a diagnosis of heart failure. It's important to note that the ejection fraction does not always correlate with symptoms. So you can have an ejection fraction of 20% and feel completely normal. Most people, however, do not. And then you can have an ejection fraction higher, like 50%, and have a stiff heart and have more symptoms. So you can see that there really isn't a correlation between the, what that number is and how you feel. But they are both important, the ejection fraction and the symptoms, in helping your care providers decide what medications and or devices you should be on. Next slide. So there's currently no cure for heart failure. 
but it can be prevented and it can be treated. Now, an early diagnosis and proper treatment can slow the gradual progression of the disease, keep you out of hospital and save your life. And that's part of what heart failure clinics are all about and those people who help take care of patients living with heart failure. Next slide. So part of the package when you go see a, uh, your care team, we review your medications to make sure you're on appropriate medications. We review the importance of self-care, things that you can do to help manage your, uh, your uh, diagnosis of heart failure and work with your care team. Sometimes there's even numbers for you to write down as well. We always talk to you about your goals of care uh, whether you want symptoms, uh, some people are candidates for advanced therapies, but this is really an important part of, of the entire heart failure visit. You'll meet the heart failure team at, at a clinic, and uh, oops, there we go. You'll meet your heart failure team at the clinic, and this is often a, a big group of people, including physicians, nurses, physiotherapists, pharmacists, um, so it really is an interdisciplinary care team. And not only do we think about medications to improve your quality of life and help you live longer, we also consider devices for patients as well. We're not gonna get into a lot of detail about that today. Next slide. So there's really two types of heart failure. One is if you have a stiff heart muscle, one is if you have um, a weak enlarged heart. So if you were to have a stiff heart muscle, the things that we do to control your symptoms or uh, minimize your heart failure symptoms is to control your blood pressure. We also make sure that your heart isn't beating too fast and we have medications to do both of those things. And then we also make sure that your fluid balance is okay. And what's often required for that is a water pill. Next slide. Now, if you have a big weak heart, the other type of heart failure, there are many more medications that we consider for you. There's been a lot of randomized clinical trials that show that there are medications available that make you feel better, keep you out of hospital, and make you live longer and improve your quality of life. So they can prevent your heart from getting weaker uh, and help you live longer. Next slide. The starting block for medications and heart failure is what we call triple therapy. So there are three main types of medications that we start with. They're typically an ACE inhibitor, a beta blocker, and a medication called an MRA, which is a really long name, mineral corticoid receptor antagonist. Uh, and you can see that there's uh, examples of those drugs. Now, often we also need water pills or diuretics to help improve that water balance because there is a problem with salt and fluid retention in the setting of heart failure. And these water pills keep your ankles from swelling, improve your shortness of breath, and keep your belly from swelling as well. Next slide. There are a couple of new medications in heart failure that your physicians will also consider for you or your care team. One is Secubitril Valsartan. Um, this can be used to replace an ACE inhibitor and it's been shown in clinical trials to uh, reduce heart failure hospitalizations and make patients with a bigger, weak heart live longer. And the other one is Evabergine. Evabergine is a medication that you add on and it helps slow the heart rate, which we know is beneficial in patients with a weak, big heart. It also reduces heart failure hospitalizations and makes you live longer. Next slide. So there are many medication advances that have come along and lots of considerations in the medical care when dealing with a new diagnosis of heart failure or even if you've had a long-standing diagnosis of heart failure. It's important to ask about what therapies are available for you uh, and have that discussion with your care provider. So thank you for your interest and I'm going to hand it over now to Dr. Karen Harkness who's going to be talking to you about self-care and heart failure. Thank you. So uh, thank you, Dr. Zeroth. And I just want to remind the people on the webinar, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in, and then we will address them at the end of the presentation. So as Dr. Zeroth mentioned, that there's uh, a lot of people involved in helping someone uh, live 
successfully and enjoy their life with heart failure. And including that is uh, the person with heart failure. And there's a couple of things that you can do to help. And so this section is talking a little bit about what we call self-care in heart failure. When we think of self-care and heart failure, it's actually a process and it involves a lot of decisions about maintaining your health and managing the heart failure as well. And it's really about choosing some activities. And we talk about this in the setting of, we call the three M's. There's self-care maintenance and there's monitoring and then there's self-care management. So I'm just gonna explain a little bit about what those are about in the next couple of slides. So when you think of self-care maintenance, you think about what are the things that I need to do each day to feel well and help prevent the heart failure from getting worse. Then there are things that are related to monitoring. So what are my symptoms of heart failure and are they different? Have they changed in the last day or two and how are they different? And if there is any difference, then you look into management. So what do I need to do about that if the symptoms are changing? So when you think of the first part, which is self-care maintenance, these are day-to-day -day things that you need to be mindful of. And first of all, it's taking medications as prescribed. And we, you probably take a lot of medications. I have a hard time remembering to take two or three medications a day. And people with heart failure all, uh, often take 10 to 12 medications a day. So hopefully you've got a system that you can help remember to take them as prescribed. Work with your care providers if there's side effects that are being a nuisance. Sometimes there's just some little tweaking and some finessing that we can do to help make it a lot easier for you to take them and not have to worry about those side effects. The next one, obviously, smoking is one of the worst things you can do for your heart, so we don't encourage any kind of smoking. As far as diet, there are a couple of things that we know can help lead to fluid retention. So when you uh, have a lot of salt, water follows salt, and so you start building up on the fluid. So it's okay to have a little bit of salt. They ask for, uh, we suggest less than 3,000 milligrams a day. And what does that mean? Well, one teaspoon of, of salt has about 2,000 milligrams of sodium. So try and keep it to a minimum. Some of the easiest things to remember is if food is fresh, and you prepare it yourself, there's usually a very good chance it has low sodium. Where we find people run into trouble is those restaurants where the food tastes really good, but there's a lot of sodium on it. So it's learning to, about those choices. Fluid, um, drinking a lot of fluid can also help contribute to fluid retention. So we ask if you drink less than two liters a day or two liters or less, and that's about eight cups of fluid. So anything that is liquid at room temperature is con considered a fluid. And obviously limiting alcohol, not just the fact that it's a fluid, but also it can contribute to weakening the heart muscle. So it's not such a good idea for the heart to begin with. However, the next, the next little bubble talks about exercise. Exercise is one of the best things you can do for your heart and just overall health. But what I find is people with heart failure will tell me, well, I feel so tired all the time. Or you think of your little heart engine, it's a little two-cylinder putt-putt versus a room room kind of engine. So what we ask is you probably have some energy, but you don't have any stamina. So just like that two-cylinder putt-putt, you can get there. It's just going to take you longer. So even if we're thinking of 30 minutes of walking or some activity a day, if it's too much to do all at once, break it up. You can do maybe 10 minutes three times a day, something that works for you, that you enjoy, and that's reasonable. If you have questions about how much exercise, certainly talk to your healthcare provider. Some general rules of thumb is that if you're doing some exercise and you're short of breath to the point where you can't talk, then it's too much and time to back off. If you have to lift something, if you have to hold your breath to lift it, it's too heavy. So back off. So those are some of the uh, self-care maintenance activities. And the last one is checking your weight, which really gets into some of the monitoring. Just like someone with diabetes needs to check their sugar, someone with heart failure needs to check their weight each day. It's not about how much fat you have, it's about how much fluid you have. And we know if the fluid is starting to build up, your weight will change by a few pounds in a day or maybe five pounds in a week. And that's enough to trigger that we need to do something about that. 
So the other part of self-care is about monitoring. So when you start at the top here, what are my early symptoms of heart failure? And as Dr. Zeroff mentioned, there's many symptoms such as shortness of breath or some bloating or some swelling, and they may be different between people. However, what you will find is you will tend to have a very similar pattern of your heart failure symptoms. So if feeling bloated is something that's common for you, then that's something that you watch for. But often that takes a little bit of time and a little bit of skill and practice and learning how to do that. So definitely work with your healthcare team to maybe help identify where your early symptoms of heart failure. And if they are changing, then coming up with an action plan. So what do you need to do? Is it okay? Do you watch it for another day? Is there an extra water pill you take? Are you trying to figure out being that detective? Often when your symptoms change, there's a trigger. So you're also looking at, well, what was that trigger? Because I want to make sure that trigger has gone away. Was it a lovely restaurant meal? Or maybe you're developing a bad cold? Something's going on. And so trying to play that detective and figuring out the trigger and then coming up with a plan and hoping that plan works well for you. So one of the tools to help do this is actually called, we call it the stoplight, where you're in your different zones. So checking every day, and then you'll see, am I in the green zone, which means all clear that your symptoms are under control and you're feeling well. When you get into the yellow zone, there's a couple of suggestions on what heart failure symptoms are getting worse or that fluid is building up. Some of those are on the side of the slide here, whether it's waking up short of breath, sitting at the side of the bed, because it's hard to sleep when you lie down, and so you need a couple of extra pillows to prop yourself up. Maybe you just don't have the same energy that you would normally have. Maybe your appetite is kind of feeling a little blah, and you feel full even though you're not eating that much, or maybe you're more tired. So these are some suggestions, and what I would uh, encourage you to do is talk with your care providers to figure out what are your early symptoms, because then you know what to watch for in your yellow zone. I'll give you an example. We, we talked to some uh, care or caregivers, and we said, how do you know that your symptoms are building up? And we find as they become more expert, they actually catch it a lot sooner. And one, one daughter said to us, well, I know with my mom, I call her on the phone, and if she sounds foofy on the phone, I know that her ankles are going to swell in the next couple of days. So foofy is not on this list, but that's something that they've recognized that she's just not quite right, and then the swelling is going to come. So we start thinking of a plan when she's starting to feel foofy, rather than wait for a couple of days when her, her ankles are starting to swell. The whole idea of this is that if we can catch things in the yellow zone, we can try and turn them around with a plan so that you turn back and go to the green zone rather than go into the red zone where you're running into trouble and end up in hospital often. Having said all that, even though self-care actually helps you feel better in the long run and helps improve your quality of life, self-care is actually a skill. And be patient with yourself. It takes time. And so sometimes it's very frustrating. As you can see in the quote here, this lady took her water pill in the morning and then had an accident. So, I mean, you must feel awful when that happens. But there may be situations where you don't need to take your water pill in the morning. You can take it maybe later in the day. So come up with a plan. There's a lot of flexibility that we can work with you to make something that works well for you. I also say self-care is like a skill. And I think of playing golf as a skill. Just because you read about golf doesn't mean you're a very good golf player. You have to go out there, practice some things, swing the club. You're going to have some mulligans from time to time. Self-care is going to be a little tricky, but as, as you work through it, it gets easier over time, uh, hopefully easier than golf, and uh, things go well for you. So some tips to think about in trying to figure out what self-care works for you so that it becomes something that just becomes part of your regular life is that talk with your health care team about what you can do to help the heart failure symptoms from getting worse. Learn about your symptoms of heart failure because you may not be foofy. You may be something that you get short of breath. Whatever it is, figure it out, and they can help work through that with you so you can kind of recognize them. But then the next part is coming up with an action plan. 
And I know people will say, please, I just don't want to go back to the hospital. That's fully understandable. And if we can catch it early, hopefully we can turn things around and you don't have to end up in hospital because we can figure out that plan beforehand. Some other little tips when you're looking to leave the hospital, I call it, you need a map to help you go home. And so these are some tips on some questions you may be asking your care team. So MAP meaning M is for your medication. So you want to know what's new, what's the same, what's changed, what's gone. So because we play around a lot with those pills and so it's easy to get it confused. Um, so write it down and ask those questions. Often there's appointments. Often there could be an appointment within the first week. So when is your first appointment? Do you know how to get there? Is it a new person? Is it someone you're used to seeing? Do I need to contact them and something changes? How do I contact them? And then the last one is the plan. So if I start feeling worse, how do I know that's gonna, uh, how do I know if that's happening and what do I do about it? So we can do something about it soon enough so that we don't have to wait till things get to the point where we're back in hospital. So this slide I actually use in a lot of presentations that I do with care providers actually, and really recognizing that it is a team approach and we're really trying to be your coaches. And so we really need to understand what's important for you in your life. And so this quote says, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And I think as healthcare providers, we want to support you. And so we really need to understand what's important for you what are your goals so we can make sure that the self-care tips that we work with you are something that are meaningful for you. And so having said that, I'd like to turn things over to Jillian, who is also an expert in heart failure, but from that firsthand experience that none of us can speak to. And I'm really looking forward to hearing more about things from Jillian. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, first, I want to say thank you to the Heart and Stroke Foundation for hosting this really, really important webinar and to congratulate all of our partners um, on our first Canadian Heart Failure Awareness Week. This is something that is definitely very exciting and it's even more exciting because we are uh, celebrating um, in bringing awareness with our European counterparts as well. So there's a lot happening on social media. And so I look forward to continuing um, along that same vein uh, throughout this week. So I'm going to highlight that it is actually nine o'clock um, BC time and I have to take my medications. Um, I do so in a shot glass because <laughs> I have a fair number of pills I have to take. And I really don't feel like dropping one on the floor and killing my cat. So I'm going to take my medications and I have them in a shot glass because I'm actually um, able now uh, to take them all at once. So excuse me. Mm -hmm. One other thing I want to follow up with uh, Karen's talk um, in regards to self-care, um, I'm 42 years old. I was diagnosed um, at the age of 27 and I have been taking medications for a long period of time. And one of the things that has affected me, um, especially over the past few years, you'll hear more about my story. I'll zoom through it. It's a bit more of an odyssey than it is a journey. But uh, one thing that's helped me is the, the idea of a blister pack because I take so many medications, this helps, helps me just make sure that everything's on track and I don't have to worry about it. Not everybody likes to do that, but that's one thing for self-care. Um, also, uh, searching out uh, social support. Um, heart failure, it can be an isolating journey. Um, I'm certainly well familiar with that. And it wasn't until I found some really good sources of social support that uh, things started to turn around for me uh, mentally. And I was uh, able to feel less alone. And um, I have actually developed some friendships with people that I would not have otherwise met. So I'm just going to go through this, my story a bit here. Um, like I said, I was 27 when I was diagnosed, and um, I, it was after about three weeks worth of suffering from what the emergency doctors and my family doctor thought was pneumonia. Um, 
when I finally collapsed um, on July 18th, I know the exact day, um, my ejection fraction uh, took three more days to figure out what was wrong. My ejection fraction was at 15%. And now <laughs> thinking back to what Dr. Zira was saying, I was definitely symptomatic. I couldn't walk, you know, six feet without, without having to stop. And uh, so I was definitely in heart failure and I was very relieved at that point that they were able to figure out what was wrong. Um, it was a very serious time as my family um, was told that basically the next 72 hours were critical and that they should prepare for the worst and that they were thinking that uh, a heart transplant, emergency heart transplant was definitely in the cards. Thankfully, uh, due in large part to many of those medications, that Dr. Zeroth was talking about, um, I was able to recover to a certain degree um, and get on with my life. Um, so it's, you see here is about, about five years um, that I was really stable. Um, and at that point, I actually did have a stroke and we discovered that I my heart had begun um, to clot because uh, my uh, my pump the pumping action of the heart had actually become a lot weaker as Shelley described and my ejection fraction had fallen below 30 percent and so um, at this time I was put on um, uh, warfarin um, which is not a fun <laughs> um, a fun uh, uh, antiplatelet drug um, it's rat poison really and um, I was then uh, shortly thereafter fitted with an ICD. And if you are in heart failure, um, I know many of our heart life participants um, do have an ICD and it's something that um, is often placed as one of the first devices. Um, and for me, it was primarily um, as a, a primary prevention is because they really didn't know what was gonna happen with my heart. Um, I didn't have any arrhythmias at that time. So there we go. So I did stabilize again um, at this point so for another few years. Everything was good. My ejection fraction was stable, um, but then I got sick um, and I decompensated again um, to the point I was at less than 15% ejection fraction and my, um, my cardiopulmonary exercise test was absolutely brutal. Um, it was really, really difficult for me to continue and uh, I was hospitalized. Um, I want to note that this was the first time that I was hospitalized outside of my ICD surgery, so I was actually very well managed. Um, I spoke a lot with my team and I collaborated a lot with my team um, in regards to helping to manage uh, my weight and my fluid restrictions and my medications. And so um, I was really lucky and really fortunate that um, I was attached to a heart failure clinic. Um, I had some an experimental procedure at the time um, with the placement of a mitral clip. Um, I was, uh, so excuse me, I was actually placed on the heart transplant list um, in uh, September 8th, I think, officially uh, in 2013. Um, they thought that perhaps having a mitral clip might help with my symptoms, um, but it really actually didn't. Um, and then in March, I was uh, hospitalized again and put on inotropes, which is um, drugs they give you through an IV to kind of supercharge your heart. Uh, it's like rocket fuel. <laughs> I felt great, but I was in the hospital. Oops, let's go back here. Oh, Give away all the good stuff. Um, in any case, uh, on March 17th, um, I had an emergency LVAD, which is a left ventricular assist device, which is essentially something that takes over the pumping action of your heart. And so in the picture here, it's, I, I set it up as a bit of a birth announcement. Um, and it was just our, my way of coping with it. And it's something they attach to your heart that basically takes over. Um, and uh, I wore it in a little bag and I had a fancy little backpack that I you know, wandered around with and I plugged myself into the wall at night. And uh, it was really quite an interesting experience. And I learned to really depend on my VAD. Um, and lots of people have different experiences, but for me, the VAD was good because it actually, I got blood to my head for the first time in almost a decade. So uh, I felt really smart <laughs> at that point. I don't know whether or not I actually was. So um, on October 7th, I got the call 
um, I was actually, I was not working. Um, I was on the phone uh, with some people at the hospital doing some volunteer work. And on October 7th, 2014, I got the call. And this is me with my, uh, with my primary cardiologist, my chief hero, Dr. Mustafa Toma, um, high-fiving because he had just told me at that point that the heart um, that I was called in for uh, was actually a match, and so it was mine. And so in the wee hours of October 8, 2014, I had my transplant. And so things were going along pretty well for, for a number of years. And um, when in January of uh, 2017, I started having um, chest pains. And as a transplant recipient, that is unusual. Um, and these chest pains we later discovered were actually called coronary artery vasospasms. Um, there's a picture here that shows you that basically uh, for unknown reasons, the, the, um, the blood vessels on the coronary arteries just collapse. And so this was something that was happening um, up for me up to 20 times a day um, for almost a year. It was, very, uh, it was a very trying time until I finally, <laughs> um, my heart decided that that was enough um, and that I had a heart attack while I was visiting family in Edmonton. And uh, so that's when we learned that I needed uh, a second heart transplant. And as you can imagine, that was absolutely devastating. Um, they did place some stents to try and um, open the blood flow again to my heart, um, but it was not, uh, it was still, I was, there was no recovering from that. So I was smuggled out of Edmonton and brought back to Vancouver. Um, and I was in hospital until, uh, I received um, a second offer of a heart on January 22nd, and um, it's still unbelievable to me that um, I, I'm actually alive to speak with you guys today. Um, and before I go any further, I want to thank my donors and my donor families, um, my my family, my husband, and my entire care team, because of without them, I would not be here today. So that's the long and short part of my journey. Um, there's a lot more that I didn't tell you about, but um, for in the interest of time, I want to talk to you also about some of the things that I did to cope. Um, I started a blog when I was on my LVAD. Uh, one of the things that really helped me was writing. I just discovered that I had this voice that wasn't an academic one, um, and I started to write. So I have a blog. Um, called heartfailuretoharvard.com, and I did just post something yesterday. And um, I try to keep that reasonably active, um, and it's just a way for me to um, just write down some thoughts and, uh, and get them out there, really in hopes of connecting with people, but offloading myself, but also sharing my story, because I do believe that um, through storytelling, we are able to help each other. One of the other things I do um, that I have done is I have uh, worked with a good friend of mine. His name is Mark Baines. Mark and I met as mutual heart failure patients and now mutual transplant recipients. Um, and we set up the Heart Life Foundation. Um, the Heart Life Foundation is Canada's first and only heart failure organization that's run by patients, specifically for patients and family carers. Um, we really aim to be uh, a, a, a source of social support, so we have a very active Facebook group, but we also have a number of active uh, Heart Life Champions, we call them, um, and we're starting to grow our network, and we aim to really be a national network, so we want to provide support for people all across this country. And so you'll be hearing more and more about this later, but one of the things that we've done is we worked with partners, and you can see um, here, I think, yeah, Dr. Zeroth is a co-author as well as uh, Dr. Hark uh, Dr. Harkness as well on advocating for um, more resources and better care for heart failure patients. Um, I've also offered my perspective to the Americans. Um, they seem to like what I have to say, um, but also talking to them about cl clinical trials. Um, some of the large, the larger clinical trials for new medications and new treatments are um, most uh, very often funded by um, American organizations. And so uh, talking to them about including the patient perspective in these clinical trials and, um, and working not just 
on the idea uh, of an all-cause mortality outcome, but thinking about what patients care about and what patients need. Um, we've also put together uh, a brief article for the Canadian Journal of Cardiology talking about um, the perspective, um, our perspective of uh, and our response to the heart failure, uh, the Heart and Stroke Foundation report uh, talking about cognitive impairments, um, which has also been something that um, I've suffered with. And I know that a lot of our members in HeartLife and a lot of people with heart, uh, heart failure suffer with, and it isn't often recognized um, as a symptom. Although I will say that Dr. Sh that Dr. Zeroth did um, put that in as one of the symptoms. Um, so make sure that if you're feeling confused, fuzzy, that you talk to your doctor about it as well, because it's it's a uh, it's an important symptom. So this is my last slide. I know Cindy's probably setting. Um, this is information about HeartLife. Um, my email is there, Mark's email is there, so if you want to get in touch to talk about anything, please send us an email. Um, we are trying to be a cross-Canada network. Um, our website, heartlife.ca, we have links to our online Facebook group, um, as well as you can follow us on Twitter, and all week we are going to be highlighting a lot of um, what we call our faces of heart failures. So. Uh, recognizing that uh, heart failure does come in all shapes and sizes and that um, we really want to work towards, if not a cure, better care um, and better access to care for all Canadians. So I will hand it back to Cindy. Thank you. And um, I guess if hopefully we might have a couple minutes for, for some questions. Great. Thank you so much for our amazing panelists. And I hope everyone has a uh, an opportunity to learn from different aspects of their expertise. Um, jumping into right into the question, we do have a question from a community paramedic in BC who deals with a lot of congestive heart failure patients is wondering where they can find more information. So that ties directly into this re resource slide that um, we will be circulating this and providing this on YouTube as well, so you'll be able to refer back to this slide. But those are the places you can get it from Heart and Stroke, from Heart Life Foundation, uh, CCS, Canadian Heart Failure Society, uh, Quebec Heart Failure Society, and uh, also Heart Failure Matters. And also there are probably local resources from your provinces and territories, um, including Core Health Ontario has some resources as well, and also uh, Canada BC, uh, Care BC as well. So reach out to your local authorities and organization, and I'm sure there will be also a lot of other resources there as well. Okay. So I uh, just want to respect everyone's time. Thank you so much for participating in this webinar. We appreciate your support and appreciate you taking the time to listen to us and share our experience. And as Jillian had mentioned, we do have a full week of social media activities and other regional activities for Canadian Heart Failure Awareness Week. So help us and provide a voice. And lastly, I just want to thank Canadian Heart Failure Society for leading this initiative and our collaborators, Quebec Heart Failure Society, Canadian Cardiovascular Society, and also the Canadian Cardio, uh, Council of Cardiovascular Nurses Network, as well as Heart Life Foundation. Thank you all of you for your support, and we shall raise the awareness of heart failure and educate more to help us to improve the lives of those suffering with this disease.